Hello. Um, I'm an eye surgeon, and my particular interest in eye surgery is tumors of the eye. And um, that's quite a rare branch of, of ophthalmology. Most eye doctors, day in, day out, are dealing with much more common conditions, uh, things like uh, macular degeneration or cataracts or glaucoma. So either treating or preventing uh, blindness. I'm going to take you back first to ancient Egypt. And this is the statue of Queen Nefertiti, which was built around uh, 1340 uh, BC. And um, I discovered this when I was a student. Uh, it was the time when the Berlin Wall came down and I was chipping away at the wall and I took some time off and went to the Egyptian museum. And I came across uh, this statue. And the striking thing, there's two things. One is uh, the beauty of the queen. And the second thing is one eye is missing. And um, there are several theories of why that eye is missing. One theory is that the queen got an infection, something like river blindness, which left her eye scarred up. And um, so uh, that's how she was depicted. Uh, but there are other images of the queen from the same time that show two normal eyes. So that's probably not true. There's another theory that um, uh, when the, um, the statue was discovered in the tomb, it was upside down, and so the eye may have just fallen out over time. And then there's another story, which is the sculptor who made this fell in love with the queen, and she didn't reciprocate back, so he took revenge on her by uh, uh, painting this without one uh, eye. Whatever the reasons are, our attention is drawn to the eyes. So when we interact socially, we're looking at each other, we're looking at eye movements and so on, and that's how we uh, interact socially. So tumors of the eye, or ocular oncology, uh, is rare, thankfully. Uh, and some of these tumors are benign, some are cancers. And so they can be threatening to vision, they can threaten the eye itself, and they can even threaten life. And uh, so this is uh, a photograph of a baby uh, taken with a flash. So you'd normally see red eye. Um, but there you can see that white glow coming from the eye. And there's many causes of that. That could be normal, can be other things, but the rarest and most serious cause is a type of cancer in the eye called retinoblastoma. And when we look inside that eye, there is a big white lump in the eye, and we give chemotherapy, and the lump shrinks down, and the tumor's treated. This uh, is an adult patient who had blurred vision, went to the eye doctor. The eye doctor looked in the eye, and this is the inside of the eye, and found that kind of greeny brown lump in the eye. And this is a melanoma of the eye. So most people heard of have heard of melanomas in the skin, and it's relatively rare to get one in the eye, but you can get one in the eye. And when we do an ultrasound, you see that lump in the eye, which is like a mushroom-shaped mass. And the way we treat this is uh, we give local radiation, we put a little disc of radiotherapy on the outside of the eye, and that irradiates the tumor and kills it off on the inside of the eye. And that's called plaque brachytherapy. And here's the case during the operation. We shine a light through the pupil. That dark shadow in the eye is the cancer. And uh, then we stick uh, on, we suture on, in fact, this um, radioactive device that kills off uh, the melanoma. So that's all very well, uh, but there are sometimes uh, circumstances where we can't do those treatments. And the picture on the bottom on the left is a big melanoma. The picture on the right is a big retinoblastoma where the whole eye is full of tumor. And then those treatments don't work. And then we end up having to remove that eye. And the way we do that is the eye or the globe, as we call it, the, the whole globe is removed intact. And uh, there are four muscles that move the eye up, down, left, and right, um, and they're the main ones. And we keep those, and we put an implant, a ball, that goes into the socket, and we attach those muscles to the, uh, the ball. And so when you move your good eye, the ball moves as well. And then you wear a prosthetic eye, like a big contact lens, with, which is colored, uh, to match the other eye. And so the situation on the left is what we're doing during the surgery. That ball, we're trying to get deep into the tissues of the socket, which are shown in red and green. And the situation on the right is what we're trying to achieve with the ball sitting uh, deep in the socket, ready to receive the prosthetic eye, which is made a few weeks afterwards. 
And so once the socket heals up, this is what it looks like. There's space underneath the uh, eyelids. The socket is sitting deep and attached to the muscles and ready to receive the prosthetic eye, which sits like this. And so when the good eye moves, uh, the implant moves, and that movement is transmitted uh, to the uh, prosthetic eye. So this raises two major um, uh, points of interest. One is that there is visual impairment, and the second is the visible difference from losing an eye. So with vision impairment, if you've had good vision as a child in both eyes, then you will see things in 3D. You will see stereoscopically. So um, uh, if you were to lose the vision in one eye or lose the eye, then you lose the sight there. And things like pouring a glass of water or putting a cup on a saucer, or for drivers, they're having to turn their head more to be able to see. All those things need to be relearned. And the brain is very plastic. It does relearn all of that. And then there is the um, visible difference. Now, if I see patients who have had their eye removed as a baby and I see them, particularly when they're teenagers, often I see them in the clinic uh, with their fringe worn longer over that side, just trying to hide the prosthesis. Even though it's made beautifully and it moves and so on, uh, people become very self-conscious of this. So it's very important to rehabilitate uh, patients who've gone through this major surgery uh, in the best way possible. So how, uh, how many people wear a prosthesis? Well, it's about 0.1% of the world's population. That's 8 million people uh, wear an eye prosthesis. That's not all due to cancer. Cancer is rare. If you have a big accident to the eye, then you can lose the eye. If you get an infection, then you might have to wear a prosthesis. Or some people are just born with an eye that hasn't formed correctly, and they have to wear a prosthesis. So a lot of people have to wear a prosthesis. And how do we make prostheses currently? It's made by a, a, a specialist, an artist called an ocularist, who uh, it's a handmade, bespoke artisan process. And the first step is to take the shape of the socket. So this liquid is squirted into the socket, which then solidifies, and that gives the shape of the back of the socket. And that's called impression molding. And then the actual prosthesis is very time consuming and requires great skill, it takes hours, six, seven hours at least of work. And each of the elements is handmade. So the iris is painted on a disc and put into the prosthesis. The veins of the eye that you see on the white of the eye are made by unraveling a silk thread and sticking on to the prosthetic eye, the red uh, fine lines that are the veins of a, of a normal eye. And this has remained unchanged. Uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so. So um, about five or six years ago, I started to work with um, Steve Bell, who's a product engineer, and Gordon Bott, who is a color and photography expert, to see if we could modernize this process. And our aim was to make an ocular prosthesis with a non-invasive method that was fully digital and an end-to-end no-touch process to design and manufacture a 3D printed ocular prosthetic. And this is how we did it. The machine on the left uh, is a laser scanner of the eye. It's available in, in many clinics, we'll have this already. And it's called Optical Coherence Tomography, or OCT. And what that does is scan the anatomy. And it scans the anatomy of the front of the eye, the normal eye, so we know what the shape of the normal eye is. And then we use this to scan the socket to get the shape of the, of the socket. And that gave us the front and the back of the prosthesis of the artificial eye. We had to modify this with the manufacturer. We wanted daylight. We wanted true color uh, of the normal eye. And uh, so we were able to obtain a color raw image. And that scan, replacing that injection molding, takes 2.4 seconds in each eye. We then put this through some bespoke software in the cloud, and that generated a 3D printable file. And this is the medical grade 3D printer. And um, that makes the prosthesis layer by layer. It prints it in color. 
But it, this looks easy, but it wasn't that easy because what we found was when we do the uh, scan of the socket, it doesn't scan the whole socket. It, the bit underneath the eyelids, the bit in orange, it doesn't scan. So we had to overcome this. It's all unique data. We could get 60% with the scan. So what we had to do was the 20% missing underneath the upper lid and the lower eyelid. We had to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and statistical shape modeling of what the shape um, should be statistically. And that gave us 100% of the shape. And here are some of the results. We call this the click to print artificial eye. And on the left, you can see a part manufactured one. It's made layer by layer in the color for that area. Um, it has the veins of the eye. The iris isn't a flat disc. It actually has um, the crypts and, and, and elevations to it. And that is mimicked in this. And the cornea, which is the clear part of the eye, sits over that. And there's depth to it, as you can see in the middle and the, the right panel, that um, when you look side on, it looks more realistic because of that, that depth. We think um, this technique has uh, promise at uh, Moorfields, my eye hospital in London, and at UCL. We are running a clinical trial now comparing this technology to the uh, previous technology. And um, uh, about 10 patients so far have received this. But the very first was um, uh, this gentleman, Steve Verz is his name. Uh, he was the first to receive this. This was in the press. This is the Times in London uh, showing um, him on the day we fitted the, the prosthesis. And um, if you're wondering which eye um, is the prosthetic eye, well, I'll let you ponder on that. Thank you very much.